Coming up, a performance by Judy Kay and Donald Korn of Broadway's Souvenir. But first... This is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Well, the New York Post has just declared Jersey Boys the hit of the season, so it must be true. I it's love the New York Post. What are you I, talking about? But aside from that, <laughs> I that. love it. So here to introduce our guest, the man, the man who brought it to us, <laughs> is Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Susan is the only person in this town who believes anything she reads in the New York Post. <laughs> right, but I can so say, since I wrote and reported the story, it is true. Jersey Boys is the hit of the Broadway season. It's great fun. It's the story of Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. It has broken the curse of the jukebox musical. And here to tell us how they did that are the two men who wrote it. Rick Ellis, who when he's not writing Broadway shows is a creative consultant for Disney. And Marshall Brickman, who has written any number of, of, of great movies. Manhattan, Sleeper, Manhattan Project, which you wrote without Woody Allen. And any plays in I your room? Um, no, plays in your no room? plays. No plays. Too frightened. Is this your first theatrical? Yes. I was dragged kicking and smiling into this thing <laughs> by, uh, by <laughs> Rick. Do such a thing. <laughs> now, wait a minute. How come you, we'll get to how you got into it, but why did you decide that this guy would be the person to write the Frankie Valley story? Because he's worshipped me for many, many decades. <laughs> it's, it's, better if, it's better if Marshall describes my worship than if I do it myself. A mutual friend, the legendary Stanley Donnan, director mm -hmm. of uh, Funny Face and... Uh, yeah. We've had him on the show a couple and, times. And you've had him on the show. And Manhattan couple. Project. <laughs> Manhattan <laughs> and Sleeper. Uh, <laughs> We, we met through Stanley, and uh, uh, Rick and I were looking for something to, to do together, uh, and we decided to do a musical since I'm already married. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'll handle the jokes. <laughs> so far, so good. And Rick said that a, a gentleman uh, who had the, uh, the option on, on the, the Four Seasons catalog mm -hmm. uh, had come to him and, and uh, wanted to do Mamma Mia. And we looked at each other and we said, well, but that's been done. And then we went to lunch with uh, Frankie Valli and Bob Gaudio, the two guys, the remaining operative seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to toss it to Rick because he tells the rest of this very well. Uh, okay. Um, Do you like your talking points? <laughs> <laughs> I was so wrapped up in your story. Uh, uh, Waiting for the next joke. Well, the, you know, the... The, the song list was somewhat familiar, mm -hmm. and um, even to Marshall, who, who you know, was a, a, a red diaper baby and was, you know, knew the, all the words to We Shall Overcome, but he didn't know <laughs> the words to Sherry. And, uh, uh, Brother, can you spare a dime? That's your... <laughs> drill, you terriers. You know, drill, Yip right. Harburg, there was a great Yip Harburg special on TV a couple of weeks ago. Stick to the point. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> lunch was, that lunch with Gordio and Valley was like this, too. Yeah. <laughs> How come we know all these songs, but we don't know anything about you guys? Yeah. Which is a reasonable question, because we know all about the Beatles. I mean, yesterday, everybody was aware that it was the 25th anniversary of what happened to John. And, and we know, you know, I, I knew all about all the groups that I cared about as a kid. But I didn't know anything about these guys. I just knew the songs. Give them a place to get in to edit. <laughs> that was my pause. That was okay, my edit. Good. I just so got to remember to. They, <laughs> and they said, we were never written about, which is why you've never heard about it. Why weren't you written about? Well, there was who cared about us. We were these blue-collar dropouts. We got, you know, we'd get arrested as soon as we'd walk off stage. We were mixed up with the Sounds mob. Sounds interesting to we me. And it, that was exactly our reaction. Right. Wait a minute, guys. This isn't, th this is the story you want to tell. Are you brave enough to do it? And that's, mm -hmm. you know, all joking aside, that's the serious moment when you think, in theory, oh, it's very flattering to think that someone wants to put your life on stage. But in fact, mm -hmm. Warts and all, you're going to put it on stage? Are you brave enough to let that yeah, happen? Yeah, and, and mob, they gave you the, and all. They gave you the freedom to just no. rummage around their no, drugs you? and all that? <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to do the Michael Regal story. Can we do anything we want? No, you have an attorney. Depends on how big, the, how many points in the royalty pool you're going to give me. Art. They got the points, they got the approvals. They got the <laughs> approvals. They got the approvals, and we had a... They had a, so they had approval over what you... Well, were. but justifiably so. They were, they're, they're living, mm -hmm. such a, as far as we know, <laughs> as, of, we as of uh, whatever time this is. And um, they also have relatives and wives and ex-wives and, uh, and everything. And many of these people, have, people gun, yeah. have, have gun permits. I was, <laughs> was going to do the gun line. I didn't know you were going there. And guns without permits. Uh, so we didn't so you write that. a scene and you say, you know, the mob scene, uh, you, you take it to them with some trepidation? The mob scene yes. was right. Yes, yes, we did. Yes. And we were, we were asked, and you know, that, I use the term advisedly, we were asked to maybe not put that particular episode 
into the musical. But how could you not? No, we, not the we, one that's in. Oh, but there oh, were, the one you there took were out. Several, well, I was there were several things that didn't make it into the yeah. final cut mm -hmm. where we were what told. What sort of scenes from their lives did uh, were, were, were vetoed by these guys? Uh, things that had some, some uh, uh, um, emotional <laughs> and psychological and monetary impact on uh, um, uh, plaintiffs <laughs> and, and defendants. <laughs> But now th there's things that involve other people that are still you know, around. There's the guy and who it started. Wouldn't fair, it wouldn't be fair to musical <laughs> theater writing things, school. Things that involve other people that the audience might, you know, all be familiar. Who the audience might be familiar ah, with. Ah, so you know, you can't just drag all people's right. lives onto stage. You have to sometimes say it'll. We'll just stick with the. So four you left you out guys. the Frank Sinatra scene, for instance. For example, right. yeah. but I'm he's dead. Well, yeah, but you know, yeah, those, but he has but those rights are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I want to tell my favorite okay. story about what it was like. This is this is not like doing Sound of Music, okay? <laughs> as far as I know from reading the, the uh, uh, early on in the in the rehearsal period, there were three or four creative principles. Uh, uh, we we were doing casting, and one of them was always late. I won't say who it is. It could have been the choreographer. You just it could said have you wouldn't say. I wouldn't <laughs> Don't give hints. It, it was somebody, a uh, reasonably important person, and without whom we couldn't continue. Don't with give it. Well, uh, okay. And <laughs> good night, Grace. <laughs> the house manager. Right. And um, this happened for a couple of weeks, and, and by that time we had established a kind of nice relationship with, with Frankie and Bob. And Frankie would call, um, and he'd say, hey, so how's it going? How's it going? And I would tell him, and then one, one, one day he said, how's it going? And it was a long pause, and he said, all right, what happened? So I told him what happened, and it was a long pause, and he said, I could, I could get a couple of guys to come in and explain the facts of life to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that's wonderful. I said, well, not, n not now, but we, we may have to reach Were out Were you him. tempted? <laughs> I mean, the, review, yeah. the, the reviews are very good, except Brantley was a little cool. Were you tempted to call Frankie and see if he could... Round up some guys to teach <laughs> we, Bradley the we facts. We did, we did actually, but we thought if it happened too close to the review coming out, it would be suspicious. So. I'm tempted to call Frankie every time I read a review by Brantley. <laughs> 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 All right, um, Rick, you know um, the animosity that the critics have uh, greeted um, these jukebox musicals. Really? really? Were you? <laughs> He's going to drag me into it, Marshall. I have yet. Kicking. Did were you concerned about this? Were you concerned about? I mean, I know you. I know your taste. I can't imagine that you were a big, you know, lover of good vibrations and all shook up and these sorts of things. Why did you decide you wanted to do what initially seemed like a jukebox musical? We set out to make the best possible show that we could make, mm -hmm. and we also set out to do it at a time when this the the press hadn't uh, arranged themselves around this what they identify as an aberration, a recent aberration, which is in fact older than jukeboxes, jukebox musicals, you know. Mm -hmm. Although jukeboxes, I just read this morning, came in around 1930. Mm -hmm. Or they were called jukeboxes around 1930, maybe the idea of... But, but I mean, for a hundred years on Broadway, popular music has been repackaged in into and popular and entertainment reviewed, of various yeah, kinds. Right, right. You know, Irving Berlin built the Music Box Theater to house the Music Box Reviews. These were reviews. In 1978, Ain't Misbehavin, a, I mean, I suppose one would call it a jukebox musical now, won the Tony Award for Best Musical. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my One and Only, uh, Crazy Few. These musicals uh, that just seem to be shows that were put together to entertain um, were never uh, grouped, lumped into a genre. And I think, and I think that, and, and, and we didn't do it. We didn't get hung up on it. We didn't think. Well, so, no, did uh, you start it before there was oh, a beat? Oh, crap. Oh, crap. We're doing this. We're doing a show that nobody's going to see. But was there ever a point, see. though, where you were in the midst of writing it and you suddenly started looking at yes. one bad review after another for these kinds it of It made us very self-conscious about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Of course. It made it hard to raise money. It made it hard to, it made it, made it really hard to get actors to audition for Jersey Boys because people had just written us off. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, as you can imagine, people yeah. had just written us off from, you know, from the top of the business down to the bottom. It was a, a, it was a, a foregone conclusion that we if, we, if we came in at all, because look at, you know, our producers had just suffered a, you know, a, a, a setback yeah. of some size. We should uh, say your producers being the Dodgers, who the Dodgers. had a very difficult last year and had to downsize. And ha yes, and produced good vibrations. And produced which good which vibrations for which out, they yeah. were beaten up. They completely. claim not. They claim that they just had money and that they weren't really the primary producers, were they? I I've never spoken to them about yeah. it. Well, well we 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 digress. Above the title. <laughs> so you had so you had some some concerns, some some doubts. Yeah, yeah. but it's a little bit like saying, "Oh no, not another rectangular painting." You know, <laughs> I mean, you, you set out to make a good painting, right? And it and so. We, we set out to make a good show, mm -hmm. and, and, and we, you know, 
I, I, it was very frustrating to think that there were these outside forces that are acting on it. But in a way, that's all part and parcel of, of trying to make theater art, is that the outside does act on it. And you are kind of taken off your course and, you know, you veer off. When did you think, well, we've got, really got something here? When, when did you know you had a hit? Not yet. Oh, not yet? <laughs> <laughs> Marshall said the other day um, something quite amusing, so I'm going to quote him now. Oh, uh, and you'll see how unfunny it will be when right. I say it. <laughs> Uh, we he, can do another take. He, when you say he, he, he said, he said, I don't feel anything like elation. I just feel relief. Ah. But isn't that the case usually? Yeah. The absence of a negative. But what I like though about the book is that it doesn't have these sort of this dopey way of shoehorning things in. I mean, you make the conscious choice to when you're going to show the songs, you show them in the context of the lives of the uh, lives of these guys. So when they're performing in nightclubs, they're singing their songs. When they are auditioning uh, uh, for a producer, they're going to sing their songs. When they're in a recording studio, they're going to sing their songs. A deliberate choice on your part not to sort of say, yeah. we'll have a character with a girlfriend named Sherry. But that, you know, that's, it's easy to say that and, and that, that it's true that that was our, our intent. But then we, uh, it fell to, to the director to Des to Des to find a way of the rehearsal, right? Huh? Huh? He was no, late. No, it wasn't Des. <laughs> Des was always early. Um, uh, it fell to, to Des uh, to to figure out a way to to, to do these uh, presentational uh, moments in a way that would be interesting and and flow and everything like that. And I thought he did an absolutely wonderful job doing that because mm -hmm. you know people. I mean, as Rick has pointed out, and that didn't even occur to me, the first time we hear the big hit, Sherry, they're not even facing the audience. Yes, that's so wonderful. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, which is kind of ballsy. Yeah. And, and, uh, it's, it's cool. It was, a cool, it was a ballsy choice of us to say we're going to make the audience wait 40 minutes until they hear it. Mm -hmm. But there's, like, there's something, uh, you can't describe what that process is where he just knew. It seems so odd the first time I saw it. I thought, wait a minute, you're not even going to let us see it? And then... He turns it around and you get to see it. That's but those smart. actors are so cute. Looking at them from behind, they're still just so Well, because terrific. you've had 40 minutes yeah, of, of, get of getting to know them, to know them mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and they are cute. Yeah. That's we can ask for cute. You are a creative consultant for Disney. You're also the book writer of Jersey Boys. Your big <laughs> competition of the spring is going to be Tarzan. When the Disney guys call you in, they say, Rick, we want to pick your brain on uh, strategy for uh, winning the Tony Award. <laughs> Which side do you fall on, Jersey Boys or Tarzan? Marsha wants to know this, too. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's like, it's like Bill Clinton with, uh, with, with, with Iraq Hello. and Monica. You know, I'm very good at compartmentalizing. It's all about compartmentalizing. <laughs> Which child do you love more? <laughs> I love them both equally. Ah, uh, yes. No, so I, it's, and it, uh, you know, it, it, imagine for a, a theater kid now, uh, you know, in the <laughs> at the onset of middle age, but a theater kid, imagine being able to work on two things in the same season. I mean, it's a great, it's a great thrill, and I'm not going to screw it up by, by not saying things that I think will help one or not saying things that I think would, would, you know, would, would help the other. It's the just, strategy just be damned. It's going to be the, 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 the work itself that's going to... And you do the right thing for the right show. What what on yeah. what what sort of you universe would it be? Hillary if, Clinton. Well, in you, not well so if the right Clinton. thing, <laughs> what, <laughs> you want to win that Tony? Come on. What would Give the right thing here. be for the story of Frankie Valley that would also be right for the story of this baby who gets left in the jungle? <laughs> you know, it's just it's <laughs> they're, they're, the ah, I think Frankie Valley's pretty good. <laughs> Jersey Boys is a terrific show. Uh, great fun. I'm glad to see that it's breaking out of the theater ghetto too. You're getting a lot of attention from uh, media all over the place. It's amazing though. I have to say, it's just the power of the Four Seasons. You know, I, I have to say that I thought that. They were kind of the second-rate group, but it's uh, those songs have lodged in the consciousness of well, this country. Well, you know, one of the big, big uh, regrets that that um, uh, they had is that they were never really certified by the rock intelligentsia. You know, the Rolling Stone right. left them out of the thousand. You know, there was not one Four Seasons song. Them. Um, and recently, someone sent us uh, Richard Corliss, the critic of the Time, mm -hmm. did for the Time website a, a equivalent of a PhD thesis deconstructing the four seasons in their songs which was so arcane <laughs> and so so dense that I couldn't get through it and I think and you have a music degree don't you? and I have a degree in in music and home wiring from, <laughs> <laughs> from the what University the of Wisconsin huh? <laughs> uh, what, was, what did he discover he discovered that these are great folk artists that the, the they really had a voice that they spoke I don't know if you if, went all your life hoping someone would say someone would get you this was the article that was the justification yeah. of a lifetime of, of work. Did you ever think you'd know this much about Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons in your life, Marshall? <laughs> I wake screaming. <laughs> okay, on that 
Good joke. <laughs> Thank you, Marshall Brickman, Rick Ellis, the authors of the big hit on Broadway now, Jersey Boys. <laughs> Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. <laughs> Here's how it's going to go down. Excuse me, Mr. DiCarlo. The group. We've come to a decision. We have? We're going to pay back every penny Tommy owes you. What? Oh, Frankie, wait a minute. Let me handle this. It's a lousy few hundred grand. We got something going here. It took a lot of work and a lot of years. So? So the group takes the debt. This is his problem. Why do we take his debt? Because we're not going to let it come apart. Crazy rhythm, here's the doorway. I'll go my way, you go your way. Crazy rhythm. No, it's syncopated. See, one, two, one, two, uh. Crazy rhythm, here's the doorway. Uh, I'll go my way, you go your way. Uh. <laughs> well, bravo, bravo. <laughs> America's most misguided diva, Florence Foster Jenkins, as created by Judy Kay in Souvenir. Hello. Hello, with Donald Corrin, who's also in Souvenir as her accompanist. Cosme. Cosme. Cosme McMoon. Now, Judy, we know that you're a uh, wonderful singer in real life, but was <laughs> Florence Foster Jenkins really as bad as you just made her out to be? Oh, possibly worse. <laughs> <laughs> you can Google her and find out for yourself. I'll this bet this you is was. a lady who's. Uh, Many recordings are still to this day in yes. print. Mm -hmm. You can discover for yourself. She, she was a show business phenomenon. She, she really was. was. Yeah. was a phenomenon. In fact, her, her uh, CDs, now CDs, have been the longest continuing in print, apparently, of any other artists. All right, what's, his, what's, the, what's the allure? What's the attraction? Are we just attracted to the grotesque in this world? Incredulousness, well, I think. <laughs> well, we are, we are attracted to that, I think, mm -hmm. through history. Uh, for some reason, audiences are. They want the best and the worst. Um, but. Uh, there was something about her too that she absolutely loved what she was doing and yeah. loved the music and it was it was uh, you couldn't escape it it was an audience just ate it up mm -hmm. and you but never and you never also apparently according to the press that was written about her concerts it, there was never the hand was never tipped as to whether she knew or she didn't know so her commitment was complete and people would come and laugh but would play along by protecting her so they would not laugh to her. They either run out to the lobby and laugh or they talk to each other and laugh, but they played along. But it, it seems extraordinary that this woman, a very rich woman, who could afford to hire rent the hall, Carnegie rent hall. Carnegie she hall. booked yeah. herself into her right. and have yeah. a full time accompanist. That's right. And played she, by you. It really is extraordinary to think that she didn't know how bad she was. Do you think it's true that she really didn't know how bad she was? I choose to think she did not. Mm -hmm. I choose to think, and we, we'll never know because no one has ever written a scholarly uh, tome about Florence. So we don't, even then we might not know. But uh, I just, I think as Stephen Temperley wrote Souvenir, the, the character he created doesn't know and believes with all her heart that she is. Uh, so did she maybe have dementia? The or was she. What, well, yeah, the first thing, you know, the first question. thing that Cos Cosme says when he first yeah. hears it, when he does an aside to an audience, he wonders whether what he's experiencing or witnessing is delusion or dementia. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is she really sick or is she just deluded? But everything? he goes and along with her because why? Good well, first he needs the money. Yeah. He's a depression baby who's out of funds and no one's buying his songs mm -hmm. and she's a rich woman who's raining money. Mm -hmm. But then he, her, her total belief in herself just compels him because he lacks that. And the relationship mm -hmm. is really yeah, much and they become yeah. under each other's wing. I think is what is so touching it's really about a love the piece. Story yeah, in many ways. What's the setting? What the time of the play is in New York, nineteen? Uh, uh, the story actually, actually you come yeah. well, you That's come right. into a piano bar in 1964 where Cosme is kind of has ended his career as mm -hmm. kind of like. Oh, the Marie's crisis Saturday. type of No, place, I think Marie. it's a couple of steps up from Marie's, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's a nice supper club. He's got a good job, but the best is behind him. Yeah. And he tells this story, and people know that he has this story. He's like, you know, if what is the character in Sunset Boulevard? Uh, Joe. The, yeah. If Joe the had Bob lived, oh, Andrew, yeah. <laughs> people would know that he was the one to go to about all the Norma Desmond right. stories. Yeah. Judy, did she read her reviews though? I mean, clearly the and critics they, must have been <clears throat> savaging her. Well, they did. Sometimes they were sort of in code. I mean, I, I have all these clippings, and some of them are sort of uh, trying to let her down gently, mm -hmm. and then some of them are quite barbed, and I, I, my understanding is that she believed that those people were simply jealous of her great <laughs> gift. <laughs> now, the, one of the wonderful things about this play is watching you, Judy, a famous Broadway 
professional with who a can mag- syncopate with, and sing on yeah, can sing. <laughs> just strangling the music could you show us an example of the real Judy singing and Judy as Florence Foster well, yeah. let's do it we, we kind of worked on a little thing a little gift okay for you here. Right. Judy, Judy first and then, then we'll show you through a mirror darkly <laughs> <laughs> This is the first time Cosme hears her sing. The famous Caranome from Rigoletto. That's its own kind of genius, I must say, Judy, <coughs> to sing that way. Is it harder to sing badly than it is to sing well? Um, I don't. I can't really say that that's true. Mm. I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't think it is uh, more difficult. I mean, I've been doing it a while now, so it's, <laughs> you're maybe asking the wrong person. But uh, I think once I've sort of made decisions about how I was going to treat this music and, mm-hmm. and the variations like jazz are just bad variations mm-hmm. I'm trying to find my own way through you know channeling Florence um, I'm just having so much fun it doesn't seem hard to me it's a relief when I do finally get to sing the stuff the way it was meant to be sung Which is a surprise. <laughs> yes is a surprise well, when it comes. <laughs> is every bad note worked out Exactly. Uh, so you your freedom and she is he will so tell me, yeah. consistent. She sings she's consistently if, bad in this. But she sings it as if she's singing an aria. She's just a different score. Yeah. And I, I'm always assuming that she has to do that too. Well, but it's she's almost also as though that she's living voice. in another world. Oh, yes. I mean, it's she's not with you, really, even though you're together and you're teaching her the music, but in her mind, she's somewhere well, else. Well, we share a world, but it's mm. on her terms. Well, Florence yeah. used to used to uh, be somewhat selective <clears throat> about her uh, the melodies that she chose to sing because she believed that the, the, the notes that were written were merely signposts <laughs> that were there for the artist to sort of guide them through the melody. And she, she would. She would some nights decide simply not to sing that note. <laughs> well, it's a little high. I don't think I'll, I'll sing that today. Uh, so, it's marvelous. So now, we're we're, we're going we're to say goodnight to you now. But, but we should say this is Souvenir, play at the Lyceum Theater. Yes, yes. a play with music. A play same. with music. We'd like to also point out that it isn't, it isn't two hours of hearing no, that. no, it's, it's only really minutes. about ten or fifteen minutes all the way through. It's mostly a sprinkled judiciously. Yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a funny and moving play. With Donald Corin and Judy Kay at the Lyceum Theater. Now, um, before you leave us, though, can we hear the um, the Judy Kay we know and love from Broadway? Well, as it's almost Christmas, we'll do a little something that might relate. Santa Maria. Santa Maria, Maria, Oh, <laughs> 
Not as good as Florence Foster Jenkins, but it'll do for <laughs> us. <laughs> Judy K. Donald Korn uh, from Souvenir, thanks for being our guest tonight in the Thank theater. You. Talk. Thank you very much.